2 Chronicles chapter 20. I hope everyone has their Bible this morning. We can't live without it. If you don't have it, maybe the person to your left or right will share with you. You can give them that little settled glance, you know, slightly looking over their shoulder. Praise God. If you have it, say amen. amen. Message is titled, Worship and Watch God Fight. Beginning in verse 1, after this, the Moabites and the Ammonites and with them some of the Minyanites came against Jehoshaphat for battle. Some men and they came and they told Jehoshaphat, a great multitude is coming against you from Edom, from beyond the sea, and behold, they are in Hazazan Tamar. I'm still not sure if I get that right, but that is in Gedi. And then Jehoshaphat was afraid and set his face to seek the Lord and proclaimed a fast throughout all Judah. And in verse 4, and Judah assembled to seek help from the Lord. In all the cities of Judah, they came to seek the Lord. And Jehoshaphat stood in the assembly of Judah and Jerusalem in the house of the Lord before the new court and said, O oh Lord God of our fathers, are you not God in heaven? You rule over all the kingdoms of the nations. In your hand are power and might so that none is able to withstand you. Now skip down to verse 9. If disaster comes upon us, the sword, judgment, or pestilence, or famine, we will stand before this house and before you. For your name is in this house. And we cry out to you in our affliction, and you will hear and save. Skip down to verse 12. O oh, our God, will you not execute judgment on them? For we are powerless against this great horde that is coming against us. We do not know what to do, but our eyes are on you. I'll say that again. We do not know what to do, but our eyes are on you. And meanwhile, all Judah stood before the Lord with their little ones, their wives, and their children. Worship and watch God fight. Here is a time, a period in King Jehoshaphat's life where he comes against um, a mighty crisis has arised. Circumstances that are beyond his control and beyond what he's able to do. Now, when you look back for a season, Jehoshaphat served the Lord, was fully aligned to his will. And then for another season, he created an alliance with another king that was out of the will of God. And so we don't quite fully know why these three armies were coming against King Jehoshaphat, but maybe they had assumed that at this time, maybe he was a bit vulnerable. But what we find in this story, in this chapter, is that when you turn to God, God shows up and does something supernatural. And so King Jehoshaphat in this time, he receives word. He finds out that three armies are on their way, which really represents to us this, this concentrated effort from the powers of darkness to destroy God's people. But darkness will not prevail. God will fight for us. And it's important to understand as we look at Jehoshaphat in this moment that yes, sometimes due to circumstances, we're going to have to deal with fear. We're going to be afraid sometimes. It's going to happen. It's a part of the human nature to sometimes due to circumstances, due to a trial, due to a situation in life, we get a little in distress. We struggle with fear. It happens. Happens to the best of them. I struggle with fear. I don't like spiders. <laughs> you mean to tell me that there's something wrong with me? If a spider creeps up in my bedroom and I don't get a little nervous and afraid, it happens to the best of us. We all get afraid of something at some point in our lives. It's normal. And you've got to be able to understand that and to recognize that and to know that we as humans sometimes are going to have to face fear. But in order for you to be able to face fear, you've got to face God. In the original Hebrew, when the scripture gives us this 
picture of Jehoshaphat in fear and then going to face God. The original Hebrew describes the verb as almost being one, fearing and seeking God, which means scripture is trying to reveal to us that you don't dare confront fear without facing God. It's one and the same. The moment I'm dealing with fear in my life, the moment I'm dealing with fear in regard to crisis, in regard to trial, you've got to turn to God. You've got to face him. It's the first reaction that you and I must go into. Not to face the enemy, but to face God. Not to face the darkness first, but to face God. It made perfect sense that King Jehoshaphat would begin to assemble the armies and begin to prepare for battle and prepare for war. It would make perfect sense in the natural. But in the supernatural, we look to God immediately in the time of crisis. That's our first reaction. That's got to be your first commitment. You can't face the enemy without facing God. You can't confront the enemy without inquiring of the Lord. To inquire of the Lord is to know exactly what the Lord would want you to do in the time of crisis. I want to hear his voice. I want God to speak to me. No matter the situation. No matter the circumstances, no matter the trial, I want to know. I want to know in his word what he wants me to do. This is why you got to be studying this word. This is why we have to live this word. We have to eat off this word. It's got to be a part of your spiritual nourishment on a daily basis. Moment by moment, I can't be able to move forward when darkness is pressing on me, when I'm in distress, when the pressures of life are coming. If I don't know this word, I don't know how to react when it's coming at me. Church, it's important. It's important that come Monday, although we've been fired up and excited about what God is doing here in the house, and some of us, we might be here all day long getting stirred up, in God's house. As young people like to say, this place gets turned up. <laughs> yes, it does. But I got to be able to have my time with the Lord come Monday. Amen. Because come Monday through the week, there's trials, there's challenges, there's crisis, there's the pressures of the enemy that keeps coming at us. But I'm standing on his word and I face God and I seek his face. And then King Jehoshaphat says, man, in this moment, I, I'm, I'm afraid, but I'm, I'm going to seek God. And then he says, now we all just need to come together. And that's the body of Christ. That's the church. That's exactly what we're doing right now. We come together. I thank God for Pastor Carter, who's leading us as a church to pray, to fast. We know this. We know that we're in dark times. We know that the challenge is ahead. We know that there's pressure. But oh, if the church would just continue to come together, standing together in unity, praying and fasting, to fast as a part of prayer is very important. It's an important moment for Jehoshaphat to call for a fast. This is why I, 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 I look forward to Tuesday fast. My body says no. But my spirit says yes to fasting. My body says, give me that bacon, egg, and cheese on a whole wheat bagel, lightly toasted with a little butter and a little salt and pepper. And if it's closer to noontime, I'll take a little strip of ketchup right around, you know, just, just for that, for brunch. That's what my body says. But my spirit says, in times of crisis, when the enemy's coming, maybe I need to change my routine in order to be fully engaged with God. Maybe I need to discipline my spirit man in such a way where I need to remove food out of the picture which my flesh craves so that in the time that I desire to eat, or would normally eat, that would be the time that I pray and seek his face. I just want to encourage you.
Because, you know, you get some folks that, like, it's taboo when you bring up the word fast. And we see it. We, I, it's so funny, you know, you know, working on our fourth floor in our office come Tuesday, I always love walking into one of the other offices on a Tuesday fast, which we encourage everyone to fast. But as Pastor Carter shares with us, we don't force you to fast. Some people can't fast. They're not able to fast, and they have to eat a healthy meal, and we understand that, and you have to do that. But then there are some folks, I walk into the, into the room, and they're in the middle of eating their lunch at their desk. And as soon as they see me come in, they're like a deer in headlights. Now, if that ain't conviction, I don't even got to say nothing. And when they look at you like that, you know that they didn't need that meal. Some of our people that work on the fourth floor, they're looking at me now kind of funny. I love you, God bless you, but it made for a great illustration this morning. But fasting is important in the discipline of our spiritual growth. And I want to challenge you and encourage you to do it. I want to encourage you to just seek God whether it be one meal, two meals, maybe the Lord would just lead you for the entire day. And in that time, you just seek his face. In that time, you just pray. In that time, you just call on God and just, just pursue him. Amen? Amen? They come together. They stand together in unity. They pray. And in that prayer, Jehoshaphat does a couple of things here. He commits the situation to God. He prays, in your hand are power and might so that none is able to withstand you. It's a moment where he recognizes that God has all power and authority. Power over all people and all situations. You've got to establish that in your prayer life. We as a church, when we come together, when we pray, when we cry out to God on behalf of the country, on behalf of the world, when we lift up these prayer requests that are coming in, this is prayer in faith, knowing that God is in full control. He has all power and all authority. In their time of prayer, they said, God, show us mercy. You have to seek the Lord, knowing that you are his people, knowing that you belong to God, knowing that you've been adopted into the kingdom of God. Knowing that because of Jesus Christ, I'm no longer an orphan. So I'm not praying to just some estranged God. I'm praying to my Father. You have to recount the grace and the faithfulness of God. There's power in prayer when you're able to pray knowing that God and his righteousness has kept you time and time again. I'm learning how to pray knowing in my heart, in my mind, that God, whatever is ahead, you're going to give me the grace to go forward in it. Amen. Knowing that God, you have been gracious yesterday, last year, five years ago. Folks, we wouldn't be gathered here in the house of the Lord today if God wasn't gracious. And that's how we pray. We pray knowing that he's the beginning and the end. We pray knowing that in the beginning of our journey, God has been gracious. We pray knowing that in the end of our journey, God is going to continue to be gracious. We continue to pray knowing that God is going to keep us, knowing that God is faithful. And I'll continue to rehearse his goodness and rehearse his kindness and rehearse his steadfast love for us. Hallelujah. You've got to acknowledge God's sovereignty over the situation. That's what they began to do in their prayer time. In verse 9, it simply said this, whenever we're faced with any calamity such as war, disease, or famine, we can come to stand in your presence before this temple where your name is honored. We can cry out to you to save us, and you will hear us and rescue us. That's bold prayer right there in the time of crisis. I love that. God loves when we pray out loud boldly to him. God, you're going to hear me 
and you're going to save me. It's being able to pray knowing that I am able to stand in faith because of the finished work of Jesus Christ. When Jesus went to the cross, he conquered sin and death. He defeated it, right? So we know the end result. So if I know the end result, then I need to pray like I know the end result. Because sometimes my, my prayers in the moment of distress is, oh, please, please, God. As if you don't know what the end result is. God, I'm going to begin to pray like this. God, you're going to save me. I know you are. You're faithful. I win at the end of this. And I, I grew up playing soccer, and, I, and I, I enjoy watching soccer sometimes. And there's been a couple of, like, uh, soccer tournaments going on right now. One, one of them is, like, the Euro Cup. And, and, the, and the other day, there was this cringing game that was tied. And the camera kept flashing to the fans. And I kept seeing multiple fans, fans going, please, please, God, please, God. Please, please. And everybody's hands just clenched like this. As if God really wants to intervene on a soccer game. <laughs> but you know, sometimes we pray like that. As if maybe we'll win this or maybe we won't. So please, God, I, I don't know if I'm going to win at the end. Of course you're going to win. You're a child of the living God. There's no tie at the end of this game. There's no loss. We win. We win. See, we take comfort in his promises. God will save. We profess complete dependency on God's deliverance. In verse 12, King Jehoshaphat prayed, for we are powerless against this great army that is coming against us. We do not know what to do, but our eyes are on you. And there comes a point where we just have to simply express to God, I don't have it in me. I'm weak. I'm frail. But see, it's in our weakness that God is made strong in our lives. It's, it's okay to profess that, that moment of not knowing what to do. I mean, there was a moment of real humility with the king here in that moment. Could you imagine? He's the king, and everybody's gathered, everybody. And his prayer is, as the king, I'm powerless. But see, there's power in expressing that you and your flesh is powerless. There's power in that because it leaves room for God to do something supernatural in your life. Turn with me real quick to 2 Corinthians 12. Paul said this. I'll just go ahead and read it for the sake of time in verse 9. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my strengths. No. I will boast all the more gladly of my preaching. No. I will boast all the more gladly of what I do for my local church? No. I'm going to boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses. Why? Why would I do that? Why would I express the fact that I'm empty? Why would I express the fact that I'm powerless? So that the power of Christ may rest upon me. For the sake of Christ, then I am content with weakness. Which means I'm happy with it. I'm happy. Content means happy. That's crazy, Paul, but it says it here in the Word. I'm content with weakness, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities. Paul's basically saying, bring it on. For when I am weak, then I am strong. I'm strong. When I am weak, then I'm strong. And when you pray like that, God responds. And God's response is his promise. God's response is his promise. 
Look at verse 14, back to 2 Chronicles chapter 20. And the Spirit of the Lord came upon Jehazel. The Spirit of the Lord. I'm going to stop right there. The Spirit of the Lord. You see, it's not by might nor by power, but by my Spirit, says the Lord. If there's going to be any change, if there's going to be any breakthrough, if there's going to be any miracle, it's got to be by the Spirit of the living God. It's the Spirit of the Lord, not in my own strength, but in the power of Jesus Christ. And so I'm just going to move through this because we, we've got to move this along because I want to get to the worship part. God's response, God's promise, here's what the Word tells us. 15, verse 15, thus says the Lord to you, do not be afraid and do not be dismayed at this great army. For the battle is not yours, but God's. For the battle is not yours, but God's. Tomorrow, go down against them. They will come up by the ascent of Ziz. You'll find them at the end of the valley, east of the wilderness of Jeruel. You won't need to fight in this battle. Stand firm. Hold your position. And see the salvation of the Lord. On your behalf, do not be afraid and do not be dismayed. Tomorrow you go out against them and the Lord will be with you. This is the word of the Lord for you and I today. I don't know what mess is coming up against you right now. We could run a long list. I'm sure we could. But nothing, nothing can come against the promise of God. The battle's not yours, but God's. The battle against temptation. The battle against all types of pressure. The battle against evil rulers of this unseen world. So you stand firm. Church, stand firm. We stand firm in the city. We stand firm in our homes. We stand firm on our job. We stand firm in our neighborhood and hold your position. What position? The position that we have on the rock of our salvation, Jesus Christ. The only way you're going to see me move is if the Lord tells me to move. And right now he's just telling me to just hold my position and just stand firm. It's not my fight, but we win. I don't got to raise my hands and fight this one. I'm used to knuckling up with somebody. I'm used to coming out my mouth and saying what I need to say. I'm used to trying to figure it all out myself, but God is telling me now in his word, stand firm and hold your position. You're not fighting this fight. The moments of crisis, the moment of distress, if you would but pray and believe in faith in a mighty God, but you've got to pray in faith. You've got to believe in faith. You've got to stand firm and hold your position and watch what God will do because he's faithful. And then here's the response of King Jehoshaphat once they get this amazing word of God's promise. It's amazing. They begin to worship. Some of the folks just start to just fall on their face. They just, they just get right down on their face. Others are standing and just raising their hands. Because at this point, because of God's promise, we raise our hands to fight. That's how we do it. And so they begin to worship God. Now here's what's so amazing to me about this moment in Scripture. They begin to praise God. They begin to worship God. And the armies are still on their way which means you've been given God's promise. You've been given his word. He says, do not fear. Do not be dismayed. The battle's not yours. It's mine. So all you need to do is just hold your position, stand firm in faith in Jesus Christ. Now, because of the word, they begin to worship. Not because the battle's over. Not because the fight has already happened. We worship in advance because we know that God's word is true. They're still coming. 
They're coming right towards him, but they begin to worship. Scripture tells us that King Jehoshaphat, they, they wake up the next morning and they're still worshiping. And they're praising God with a loud voice. And King Jehoshaphat, he says something. He says, you've got to believe in the Lord your God and you will be established. Believe his prophets, which means believe the word of the Lord. Believe the word that has come forth. Believe in this scripture. Don't doubt it. Don't question it. Believe it. And you will succeed. And when he had taken counsel with the people, he appointed those who were to sing to the Lord and praise him in holy attire as they went before the army. And they said, give thanks to the Lord for his steadfast love endures forever. There's, an, there's three armies still coming and they're getting their worship on. There's three armies coming and they're giving God thanks. It's still a moment of crisis, but they're giving God thanks. The circumstances still look very ugly, but they're giving God thanks. Darkness is on its way. Darkness is pushing against them. Darkness is coming in from three sides, but they're still giving God thanks because his steadfast love endures forever. Steadfast love. The love of Jesus Christ, the unconditional love that we have from the Father through his son Jesus. Because perfect love casts out all fear. So when Jesus goes to the cross, fear cast out. And perfect love has wrapped us up and embraced us. And in his perfect love, there's always victory. If you would believe in faith. If you would pray. There's perfect love that casts out all fear. If you're walking in his perfect love. If you believe in faith in the perfect love of Jesus Christ. If you pray to a God who loves you and gave his only begotten son to die on the cross for you. That's the picture of perfect love. And when he died on that cross, that's it. He wiped out the debt that we owed, the sin debt that we owed, gone. He paid the price. He canceled the debt. And he's taken us back as his own. But he's not taken us back as beat up, destroyed, ruined people. He's taken us back as redeemed, righteous, powerful, strong people. And so we give thanks we give thanks because his love endures forever. And despite how I might feel with my fear, I'm facing God. I'm about to wrap up here. But this past weekend, I took my kids to the carnival. You know, I'm in a small town, so you know, they get these little carnivals that come rolling in. And I got to take my kids. And I'm not crazy about carnivals. I don't really even do crowds that much. Like my favorite crowd is always like coming into the body of believers and shouting and praising God. Every time I get into big crowds, I'm just reminded of how many people need Jesus. But I take my kids and I've got one high schooler and one middle schooler and then one in elementary. And so we're only about a hundred feet into the carnival and the high schooler texts his friends. And next, you know, he just drifts off in the crowd to go be with his teenage buddies. Okay. All right. I remember when he used to hang with me, but that's okay. I said, I got my two girls. So me and my two girls, we get on the Ferris wheel, and I don't even like the Ferris wheel. I don't even care how slow it goes. But when we get all the way to the top, well, you know, the imagination just runs. But by the time we got off the Ferris wheel, my middle schooler, she's texting her friends, and all of a sudden her little middle school buddies show up, and next thing you know, she's off in the crowd. I'm wrestling with that one, all right? Don't, don't rebuke me, but I'm, you know, I'm trying to give them a little space. So it's just me and the baby. <clears throat> okay, here we go. So we do a couple of rides. That's easy. It's a little small rides. They're not going very fast. They just kind of oop up, down like that. And we shouting. We're getting excited. And I'm putting on my best smile because I want her to have a great time. And I just want to give her all the confidence in the world as she's taking these rides. She's a little nervous, you know, but I'm not thinking that, you know, I'm just kind of just, my eyes are on her and we're just having a great time. But then we're walking through the carnival and she sees what they call the super slide. <laughs> oh, y'all know about that. Why, why ain't somebody warned me or something? You know, the super slide, it like sits up like real high. 
And whoom, whoom, like just going to... That shouldn't be for no six-year-old. So I go over to, I'm assuming that her height is not going to measure up to getting on the super slide. <laughs> sure enough, she's tall enough for the super slide. Okay, all right. Uh, and then I see the line is long. You know, it's a line. It's like, man, it's a, that's a 20-minute wait for two seconds down the super slide. But it don't matter to her. And she looks up at me and she's like, let's go wait. Let's, let's wait. And she's super excited and she's all charged up. And so we get into the back of the line and, and there, there we are just waiting. And I'm just, you know, just staying focused and I'm slightly bored and uh, just thinking about how I could be studying and preparing a little bit more. And then she kind of just turns around and looks at me and she's like. <laughs> Yay, baby. Yeah. And she turns around and she faces and we're getting closer and closer and she does it about two or three more times. She just turns and just jumps up and she just gives me a big hug. And I'm like, wow, man, that's just so amazing. She's just so grateful that I'm just getting on this ride. She's so excited about it. And so here we go up the stairs all the way to the top. I stay behind her because I want to make sure I brace her fall just in case, you know, we go all the way to the top. We sit down. I said, don't you dare take off down that slot until I'm sitting in my little, uh, they're like a little blanket, you know, to make it go faster. Do we have to use the blanket, you know? We're sitting there, she's looking at me, all smiles, wide-eyed and super excited. And we go sliding down the super slide. Whew. And then, of course, I, I weigh a lot more. So next thing you know, I kind of pass her. But I'm looking back, you know. I'm looking back, you know. And we both make it down. And then we walk out of the gate. And as we're walking, this is what struck me. My daughter looks up to me and goes, Dad, I was so nervous and afraid the whole time. <laughs> what? I said, what, what? She goes, oh, my heart was beating so fast. I was so nervous. Really? Yes, I, the whole way in the line and the whole way up the stairs and all the way to the top. I thought, and I went, so you mean, to, and I said this, you mean to tell me that you felt confident going because your father was with you? She said, yes. Matter of fact, as soon as I, she said, watch this. She said, because every time I kept looking at you, I was like, whatever, whatever. Come on, man. What? Are you kidding me? Come on, Zoe, you just preached my message in like two minutes. That's it right there, folks. It don't matter what I'm feeling all up in here, the fears, the nervousness. We seek our Father. We put our eyes on the Father, and the Father is with us. Each and every one of us should have a whatever moment. You know, Pastor Carter shared it last week, you know, whatever we ask in his name, that will he do for the glory of the Father and his Son. It's time for us to have a whatever moment. And let's take the ride with our Father. Let's trust him. He's right there. He's going to keep us. He's going to hold us. I've got just 60 seconds. I need to give you this one thought and close before we pray and we worship. Here's what's really important at the end of that. While they were worshiping, God goes into battle. Listen to me. God will ambush the enemy's plan to ambush you. I don't care what you got to do, but you better write that down, put it in your memory bank, tweet it, Facebook it. I don't care what you do. But you've got to remember that God will ambush the enemy's plan to ambush you. And you, 
And so while they worship, for those of you that don't know the end of the story, it's really cool. While the three armies are coming, two of the armies start fighting the other army. And then after the two armies beat them dudes down, then confusion set in and those two armies started fighting each other. You see, anybody who tries to come against you outside of the will of God will only end up in confusion. Hey, somebody. Wait. Music ministry, you can come. We're getting ready to stand up. But listen to this. Listen to this. The story gets even cooler. They go up to a watchtower to see what's happened after their worship time before the Lord. Worship. That's your battle cry. That's going to be our battle cry right now. We're going to worship God in the face of distress and circumstances and trial. We're going to stand firm. They begin to worship. They come to the watchtower and everybody's laid out dead. So then they go down to the battlefield and there's all types of goodies. Listen to the detail scripture gives us. There were clothes, special treasures and possessions. There was so much, it took them three days to collect it. Three days. That's, that's not just a demonstration of the benefits that we have, but it's a demonstration of how powerful a God we have to fight the battle. Will you stand up? Listen, everybody listen to me. Thank you, Jesus. Glory to God. On the fourth day, with joy in their hearts, they went down to a place called the Valley of Baraka, which was an adjacent valley from where the fight was that God did. That word means blessing. In the valley, in conclusion, they blessed the Lord. In the valley, in the wilderness. I know for many of you, it's been a valley experience. You feel like maybe you've been in a wilderness. You've felt the pressure. It's been a lot. But will you bless the Lord in the valley, knowing that he will fight your battle? I'm going to invite you to come down right now. And let's pray. And let's pray in faith. You just begin to come down right now. I'm going to get out of the way. It doesn't matter to me what kind of crisis will wilderness situation you're in. I know there are many in here, there are things coming at you. Well, church, I'm going to invite you to come down here and take your position and stand firm. We're going to pray and then we're going to worship. We come before you, Heavenly Father, putting our complete trust in you. We recognize, Lord God, your faithfulness, your grace that has kept us and will continue to keep us. God, I know that there are many who are feeling pressured by many things. They're feeling pressed against by darkness. But, oh God, you are our deliverer. So deliver your people now from every attack of the enemy. Every attack of the enemy. I come against it now in the name of Jesus. Any form of wickedness, we come against it now in the name of Jesus. Lord God, I come against addiction now in the name of Jesus. 
I come against depression now in the name of Jesus. I come against all fear now in the name of Jesus. I come against loneliness now in the name of Jesus. For you have not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and love and a sound mind. So God, I'm asking that you would give your people power right now. Lord God, that you would demonstrate your love, your steadfast love, Lord God, that cast out all fear, your perfect love. And God, I'm asking that every person here would have a sound mind in you, oh God. We ask you, God, comfort your people. Bring comfort now, Lord God. Put a victory song in their heart, Lord God. A victory song of praise. Although we might still be facing the battle, but God, we're going to give you thanks. We're going to worship you. We're going to glorify your name. We're going to praise you. We're going to lift you up. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.